Okay, so we always start our uh, Green Friday meetings with a land acknowledgement and um, something different this month. I wanted to read a few paragraphs from an article by a person who appropriately describes himself as a birder. He describes himself as a uh, black American ornithologist. His name is J. Drew Lanham. And he had a really good uh, article uh, in uh, this spring's Audubon magazine. And it's an acknowledgement of um, some of the racist history that uh, exists in a lot of conservation organizations. And so he writes, last summer, the Sierra Club denounced its first president, John Muir, as a racist unworthy of organizational adulation. Muir is a founding father of the American wilderness movement. He also characterized blacks as lazy, quote unquote, sambos, and Native Americans as, quote unquote, dirty. The National Audubon Society followed suit, stating that Audubon too was a racist. Both Muir and Audubon were, quote, both Muir and Audubon were, quote, men of their time and judged accordingly, but could have been men ahead of their time and judged otherwise. The stories of icons and heroes are critical, but what happens when truth rubs the shine off to reveal tarnished reality? As patriarchy, as patriarchy privilege and the closely allied sin of racism persist, how many monuments to environmentalism and conservationism need to come down or at least be rigorously inspected? And as we consider how we treat past memory, do we need to rethink our current mission? And so acknowledging um, John Muir's racism, especially toward indigenous people is our lead into our land acknowledgement. And the, our acknowledgement is uh, wherever you are and we have people from all over California and maybe even further, um, spend a moment to reflect on the people, reflect on the, getting some echo here. Uh, to reflect on the indigenous people for whom whose homeland you currently occupy and consider ways that you might be able to uh, address that. So uh, with that, um, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, I've had a number of requests from people who join our Green Friday meetings to hear more about birds. And so, um, to hear more about uh, our avian friends with whom we share this planet. And so we're really lucky tonight to have with us Catherine Portman, uh, who is one of the co-founders of the Burrowing Owl Preservation Society to talk to us about one of the cutest birds there is, the burrowing owls. <laughs> um, and she'll talk to us about uh, how uh, they live and uh, how we as a public can, it can interact and help uh, protect them. Uh, and uh, if you have questions, I ask you put them in the chat and um, mute yourself if, if you're not talking. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Catherine Portman. Hello, Sierra Club friends. My name's Catherine Portman. I'm a co-founder along with Pam Nyberg of the Burrowing Owl Preservation Society. So uh, during the course of my talk, I'll be talking about BOPS, that's our acronym, uh, Burrowing Owl Preservation Society, B-O-P-S. Um, my, uh, I do not have an education background in ecology or wildlife studies. I, um, what I'm going to say is um, my experience from the past 20 years of the avocation as a burrowing owl advocate. Um, so our, our taxon is the Western uh, burrowing owl, Athene canicularia hypogea. In Florida, they have Athene canicularia floridana. Some of the um, folks at uh, Cape Coral sent me some pictures uh, of their owls, and some of them have brown eyes, where all of ours have um, gold eyes. So Athene canicularia is not much uh, bigger than a, a robin with an impressive wingspan for such a small uh, raptor. Um, unlike other raptors, the female is not larger 
its uh, preferred habitat is grassland. It's most active during dusk and dawn, so it is crepuscular. This is what uh, burrowing owl habitat looks like uh, in Yellow County in my neck of the woods. And uh, here's, here's my little attractive bird. And right down here, when you look, when you're looking for them, you want to look for something a little different. So uh, that's where their burrow was right there. This uh, is facing the um, intercoastal range mountains. And there was uh, this property hosted, um, where did my cursor go? This uh, property hosted uh, burrowing owls. You'll hear uh, burrowing owl people say that you will not find a burrowing owl within 30 feet of a tree. Um, whenever you say something about burrowing owls, there's always an exception. Um, so this is Wild Horse Golf Course, where when the city of Davis uh, permitted the golf course to be built, uh, one of the conditions was that they leave some natural areas. And what they chose uh, to leave as a natural area was some of the walnut orchard. And so we had several um, successful nests underneath a 20 foot walnut tree. Um, so the adults, um, when you're trying you're looking at the plumage, um, <clears throat> so the adult, this is a male behavior. They'll they'll stand upright, and then if you if you're um, you're challenging their space, um, they'll dip and they give a little so bark, a little chuck, a little chuck sound. So Katie's talking now too. <laughs> Can we get Katie? But thank you, Katie. Um, and so the uh, markings uh, here on the breast on the adult, you'll see those brown uh, brown spots. And then the freckled, it's uh, harder to see the freckled forehead. Um, so the guy's job is to guard <clears throat> the burrow. So he stands out, he's in the sun uh, more than the female who's underground <clears throat> incubating the eggs and taking care of the young. So we, we so, the, so the male is sun bleached. So we say it's blonde and chocolate and the female is, um, uh, usually darker from uh, being in the shade underneath underground in the burrow. And here they are collecting some little soft fuzzies for their baby nest. So they're underground. They can lay as many as nine to 12 um, eggs. And the owlets come up, um, up around here um, the second or third week uh, of May. They, they come up to the surface. These are 10 day old owlets. Um, a rancher um, didn't realize that the owls were nesting in an irrigation culvert uh, on their property until they let the water, open the water, started running the water. And so, but uh, was able to take the eggs and took it over to the California Raptor Center where they have the ability to um, incubate them. And so uh, they were hatched and um, grew, up, grew up and were released. What do they eat? They're opportunistic feeders. Our uh, education director used to say they eat whatever wiggles. So this is, uh, you can see this is a juvenile. See the solid buffy color here, but the uh, yummy snake for dinner. Um, they eat a lot of insects, um, <clears throat> crickets, grasshoppers, moths. Um, uh, Phil Higgins did a study, I think it was Phil Higgins, uh, around the Bay Area where the majority of the diet was actually earwigs. I don't know how you can live off of an earwig. Um, and they eat Western fence lizards. But what I really like about burrowing owls is that they love to have fun. They like to vacation at the beach. They like to play hide and seek. Sometimes they pick really good hiding places and sometimes they don't. Uh, if I don't say the name of the photographer, it was me. So uh, this is uh, Terry Nathan was the photographer. This winter owl, uh, came um, at least three years in a row to this uh, pile of uh, plywood. They like the ballet. The photographer is Michael Forsberg. They like to attend athletic events. They like to attend sporting events. These are juveniles. You can see the, lost my cursor. You can see the solid buffy breast. They like to go boating. Uh, Captain Porter uh, lent us this photograph uh, of owls that came out. He was in a barge 17 miles outside the Golden Gate Bridge. And he said the owls arrived one at a time and <clears throat> they were feeding on um, insects that came around the uh, lights on the barge. They like to attend conferences. Um, this is called a parliament. They like aerial acrobatics and to show off their wingspan. And they like to role play. I'm bigger than you. 
this uh, photographer is Robert Supli. That's a defense posture. And they like to decorate the entrance of their burrows. Can you all see what, the, what this is decorated with? Can you see these? This is Wild Horse Golf Course. They collected all of these golf tees to, de to, to uh, decorate the burrow entrance. They will decorate with gloves. We found construction worker gloves inside the burrow when we were banding and also um, golf balls. What they also like to, uh, whoops, avert your eyes, don't look. So the range, uh, so the breeding range, uh, we have uh, this year round should come up here a little bit more into Yellow County in the, uh, the upper central valley. Uh, for the year-round range in my uh, neck of the woods, it's um, they're they're considered resident. This is uh, from the Institute for Bird Populations, uh, indicating where uh, at their last census uh, that ended in 2007, where the majority of the California burrowing owls were. And uh, notable is um, that 70, a little more than 70 percent of the burrowing owls. Valley. I think this is from the Institute for Bird Populations, uh, also uh, as a result of the Institute for Bird Populations 2007 census, uh, showing where the owls were um, extirpated. Looks like around as a as a breeding uh, uh, bird. Uh, I can't tell where you guys are on Berkeley around here, um, but but here's Yellow County. And back then in 2007, um, we were marked as declining, uh, but now we're extirpated. Burrowing owl uh, habitat, they have to have a burrow uh, that they need uh, for survival 24 seven um, and they need short vegetation. Um, and around here, um, it, they usually use the squirrel burrows, uh, but like in Canada, they'll use um, badger burrows. Um, so the squirrels uh, mostly are abandoned squirrel burrows are mostly what they use in, in my neighborhood. So a burrowing owl needs, um, uh, burrow. Um, they use it to evade predators um, and to uh, shelter from extreme weather. And um, of course, uh, to raise their young, they um, lay their eggs down there and raise, raise their young there. The, so the vegetation height uh, is important that uh, they can see uh, their, their prey and uh, see predators coming for them. Um, this owl started out at the beginning of breeding season, um, which uh, here starts uh, in February, so the breeding season from February to September 1. So it started out here when the grass was short, um, but then it got tall. So for a number of years, um, everyone has noticed a population decline. The Institute for Bird Populations has conducted uh, two uh, statewide burrowing owl census, one in the early um, 1990s and the second one from uh, 2006 and 2007. Um, since you can't survey every square inch uh, of, of California, um, the Institute has a formula that they use to calculate a best estimate. And um, in 2007, they determined that the population was declining 11% uh, per year. Um, we, uh, so, so we in uh, 2014, we asked the Institute for Bird Populations if we could do another since seven years had passed, another statewide census. They said they didn't have the money. So we said, well, if, if I get the money, will you do just Yellow County uh, with us? And <clears throat> so they said they would. So in, in 2007, when they did the statewide census, the, the blocks, the, the census is divided into five by five kilometer blocks, uh, topographic uh, maps and um, citizen scientists will take, you know, volunteer to survey the blocks. So in 2007, 20 Yellow County blocks were surveyed and there were detected. So this is separate from the best estimate, um, actually detected 62 pairs in 20 blocks. So seven years later, when we did the um, just Yellow County, uh, we were able to survey 45 um, Yellow County blocks. So twice as many um, blocks were surveyed um, and only 15 uh, pair were detected. Um, another way to look at this um, is the estimated uh, number of pairs. So um, as I said, in 2007, uh, they found, the Institute found that 70% of California's remaining owls were in the Imperial Valley. So in the early 90s, they estimated 5,000 pair. In the second census in 07, they estimated 4,800 pair. Then the following year, a survey in 2008 done by the Imperial Irrigation District where 70% of California owls were, the population declined um, to 3,500 pairs. 
in Yellow County to get a little bit, dial it in a little closer um, uh, to the population. This is a wild horse golf course in Yellow County. And <clears throat> this is where uh, this, this and there's 38 acres around the east and the north edge that belong to the city of Davis that's called an agriculture buffer. And their idea was they were gonna separate agriculture, um, try to have a little barrier between agriculture and the urban areas. And so it's used for passive recreation, and we had quite a few um, burrowing owls, uh, you know, uh, breeding owls there. Um, so this was our uh, largest um, colony in Yellow County. Uh, so the wild horse egg buffer, wild horse is the golf course, and they have to keep the grass. It's you know their part of their operation to keep the grass short, so that worked out good for burrowing owls, and they didn't seem to care very much about the squirrels. So there were lots of burrows. Um, so in the egg buffer, um, so these are just data points that I could find. Um, so this guy in 1999, this guy Chan, he's a botanist. He's not, <clears throat> he's not counting, you know, he's a plant guy. He's not counting adults or pears or, you know, juveniles. And so he noted that there were 10 to 12 uh, burrowing owls there. And when he finished his restoration project in 2001, he noticed there were 25 to 30 individuals. Um, so this, um, these others are uh, people who are familiar um, with burrowing owls who had done a lot of um, surveying uh, observation of owls in 2005. Uh, Whittacom, who uh, was published in the um, symposium, the Burrow Island Proceedings from the Burrowing Owl Symposium, uh, he noted there were seven. Also in the same year, Jim Rose, who was an employee of Wild Horse Golf Course, so he was out there every day, he, he also noted there were seven pair. In the, in the Institute for Bird Populations 2007 survey, there were six. And the one that we did seven years later in 2014 in partnership with the Institute for Bird Populations, so we used their same methodology so that we were comparing the same thing. Um, there were three pair uh, found, and in 2015, there was only one pair. Now, <clears throat> there are none. Um, so also uh, trying to get an idea of the population, Yellow County population, uh, from some other people familiar uh, um, with burr owls. So in 1991, would it come uh, guess, oh, I've got to tell you, this is, this is a, a very technical, um, <clears throat> this is a very technical term here. This is a, a wild ass guess. So uh, Whittacom uh, guessed that there were 74. Brenda Johnson in 1995 thought there were between 70 and 80. Uh, John McNerney, uh, who is the City of Davis uh, Natural Resources um, Specialist, uh, said there were 50 to 60. And in our 2014 survey, there were actually only 15 detected pairs. So we kind of should have seen this coming. Brenda Johnson at UC Davis, uh, did this research. Uh, she started in 1981 uh, with 44 owls uh, on the campus, on the UC Davis campus. She had a formula uh, to predict the likelihood uh, that a species would become extinct over what period of time. Um, so 10 years later, um, the population had declined to extinction in half the time that was predicted by the formula. So in, in 81, she had 44 owls, and 10 years later, she had one reproductive extinction. So the magnitude of survival threats, um, there are incidental threats, you know, that happen to an individual and population level threats that happen to the entire, to the entire population of uh, species. So <clears throat> for burrowing owls, uh, one of the big uh, mortality uh, issues is uh, vehicle collisions. And that's partly because um, uh, if, you if you imagine that uh, adjacent to this uh, road is a field, an agriculture field, and so as part of the farming practice, you know, they disc the field. So of course that destroys the burrow. So the burrows that remain uh, are on the fence line because the tractor is not gonna run into the fence. So the, the burrows that remain are at the, at the fence, which also but most of the time is at the edge of the road. So literally the owls are using burrows right at the edge of the asphalt. Of the seven um, dead owls that I've picked up uh, over my time, only one of them was not, um, a vehicle collision. So there was one thing, sometimes we feel very helpless. What can we do about this? We feel like we can't do anything, but there's one thing you can absolutely do. And that is to slow down when you're driving on country roads. You'll um, save not only burrowing owls, but lots of other critters. There's lots of roadkill out there. Yes, those are gunshot, uh, gunshot holes in the speed limit sign. I urge you to find your local uh, wildlife uh, rehabilitator and put their phone number in your phone. Because when you have an injured uh, bird in your uh, car, <laughs> your, 
<laughs> you're going to be stressed and nervous, and that's not going to be the time you want to be looking uh, to find out where your rehab local rehab place is and their phone number. So put that in your phone. So the population level threats <clears throat> um, are habitat lost. Uh, the majority of um, the majority of uh, of the population of, of any critter that we lose is because of habitat loss, and that's human land use conversions. The other population level threats uh, are the California Environmental Quality Act and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So when we change human change, humans change the landscape. So we'd rather have malls and grassland. Uh, so when this pair came back to their breeding ground, they decided to use this. Um, the best thing they could find was this fallen down um, for sale sign. Uh, so there's the male there guarding and the females uh, trying to use the corner underneath the corner of the sign for a burrow. Uh, we found out that um, uh, the turbines um, whack uh, raptors out of the sky and uh, Sean Smallwood's research uh, show that the burrowing owls are greatest among them. Even uh, when it's public land, uh, we can, can is it? Can we get that thing off there? Is that my choice to take, admit that person? Oh, okay. Um, so this is uh, Yellow County Grasslands Park, um, and we uh, so it's public land, and we um, got this 60 acres uh, here uh, dedicated for burrowing owl uh, habitat uh, before, as mitigation for um, uh, owls that were dissed into the ground uh, in Davis um, for the uh, Mace Ranch housing development. So the, the pressures uh, are so great on you know, every square inch of land. So now this area, this area over here is, um, oh, I lost my cursor. Yeah. This area over here in the upper left-hand corner, I'm losing my cursor, I guess, because it's white, uh, is solar panels now. Uh, this area down here uh, is gonna be a 10 acre dog park and there are gonna be some uh, uh, passive recreation trails over here. And over here, there's gonna be a, um, uh, there's going to be an education center. So, so even when it's public land, um, uh, there are so many, you know, people want to use the land for so many other things. So um, this, uh, our, as an aside, our, well, or actually maybe more to the point, um, our Borough Owl Reserve, the city of Davis never um, complied with the habitat management plan and allowed the vegetation to grow uh, tall so that um, there are no owls at the Borough Owl Reserve. And as I said before, you know, this is what burrowing all habitat looks like in Yellow County. And that was uh, private land. So that now became a, um, is now an olive orchard. And so they're putting up their barn and making their road there. This was also public land. Um, some of it belonged to the city of Davis and um, it, it did, be, the whole, it all belonged to the city of Davis. And they uh, partnered up with the Yolo Land Trust uh, and decided they were gonna sell a conservation easement to, um, to a person. So the person that they purchased the conservation easement from, uh, they allowed to uh, put in an orchard, and, uh, almond orchard, and also to build two two-story houses uh, in a swimming pool. Um, so, so even when you get a conservation, so you have to, you have to monitor these things and have input on these things uh, all the time because, you know, you think, oh, good, you know, it's a conservation easement. It's all good. Well, no, it isn't. Um, and so this owl's uh, burrow, where's my crew? Okay, so this owl's burrow was, was down here on the road. Uh, so uh, so you're, you're a private property owner and you're a developer, you wanna build something on, on your land. And so what do you do? Lock out, burrowing owl lock out, plan to make way for houses. And this is the best description I ever saw a newspaper reporter give of this process. So in this right-hand column, uh, to evict the owls, uh, an environmental consultant, that is a, a developer hired uh, consultant, install one-way doors on the owls' burrows. Where is my cursor going? So that when the owls go out, they can't get back in. And then after the owls are out, uh, the burrows will be destroyed. <clears throat> the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, instead of drafting a conservation plan, they drafted a staff report um, of recommendations and uh, suggestions for burrowing owl mitigation. 
So these were not uh, enforceable. This is not the first uh, iteration of this staff report. This is the second iteration. The first one was in 1995. But in also the initial one, 1995, uh, in the staff report was called passive relocation. So it's uh, burrowing owl uh, exclusion and closure. So the practice allows the developers to install a one-way door um, to, uh, so that when the owl goes out, it can't get in, it can get back in to its shelter. Um, and then and after they're out, then the burrows are destroyed. And they and the then and, and the CDFW wants every borough on the property, uh, whatever the project site is, to be closed. All of the, all of the boroughs to be closed. So there's not another borough available. So this is a misapplication of research um, by CDFW because um, Dr. Lynn Trulio um, at San Jose State uh, did this research where <clears throat> she determined that if uh, artificial burrows, uh, alternate burrows were installed uh, nearby where owls were being evicted from the occupied burrow. Uh, so the owl go, is uh, evicted from that burrow, the burrows collapse, they'll go to the alternate burrow. And she found a uh, 90% uh, success rate at that. Well, uh, the trouble uh, with the interpretation of CDFW is they forgot uh, that they're supposed to supply uh, alternate burrows. So this is what they look like. Um, one of them, uh, some of them use those um, drier, um, drier vent uh, to flaps. Um, one a biologist I know went onto a site where owls were being evicted, and she found that the um, biologist had installed the doors um, the wrong way, so that the owls were trapped inside. They were inside and couldn't get out. And there's another example of what they look like. Um, so the alternate burrows are not provided. And that's the that's the primary um, part of the passive relocation, which is definitely a misnomer. It's active eviction, and this is in the staff report um, that the um, depending on the availability of alternate habitat, the loss of access to burrows results in varying levels of increased stress on burrowing owls, could depress reproduction, increase predation, increase energetic costs introduce risks posed by having to find and compete for available burrows. So often the situation is you have one open lot that hasn't been developed around this whole rest of this urban area that has been developed. So there is no, there are no other uh, burrow, natural burrows for them to go to if, all, if uh, artificial burrows are not provided. This is also in the staff, staff report. Eviction of burrowing owls is a potentially significant impact under CEQA. The consequences of these techniques have not been evaluated and the fate of evicted owls has not been studied. Because burrowing owls are dependent on burrows at all time of the year for survival, evicting them from nesting, roosting, and satellite burrows may lead to indirect impacts or take. And uh, take is a, a kind of sterile word to, um, to kill them. So because uh, when CDFW approves these, so the, the developers, um, biologists will uh, submit a, a, a plan and show and submit it to CDFW uh, to say, this is what we're gonna do. And so then CDFW says, okay, uh, okay, you can do that. So when, when CDFW approves these eviction plans, they don't ask uh, the developer to ban the owls. So you can't say, oh, here's a dead owl and it's banded. So we know that this is an evicted owl from this project site. So you can't say that. So there's no proof. Um, as a result, then passive relocation does not fall within the definition of take technically. So um, in 2003, uh, there was a um, burrowing owl symposium in Sacramento and the proceedings of that symposium were published. Um, these two um, burrowing owl um, experts, uh, Townsend and Lenahan, wrote in the proceedings, current protocols uh, for managing burrowing owls may also threaten their survival and reproduction. When using one-way doors for passive relocation, Fish and Game recommends replacement burrows are available nearby on adjacent lands and secured for long-term habitat. Well, they're, they're not. Uh, and, and they're definitely not uh, long, secured long-term for burrowing owl habitat. And, the, and, and uh, these uh, knowledgeable um, burrowing owl biologists say replacement burrows are usually not provided. So that was my experience as well as theirs. 
They also go on to say that um, post eviction monitoring to determine the fate of these owls is rarely implemented or required. Displaced birds unfamiliar with new areas are less likely to breed and are more susceptible to mortality from predators. Also in the proceedings, um, two other variable, uh, four very knowledgeable uh, burrowing owl experts, uh, Jeff Kidd and Pete Bloom. Uh, we believe the continued endorsement of uh, uh, fishing game of passive relocation and its use as a preferred mitigation and conservation tool and its misapplication by biologists has accelerated the decline, is not known to have protected even one pair of nesting owls and has contributed to the species decline. Also in the staff report, the first, the 1995 staff report, it, you had to confirm that the owls occupied the site. And so we often had situations where the developers, biologists, would go out there and say, oh, no, there's no burrowing owls here. And so you get no, and so then, so then we had to fight uh, to demonstrate. So all the locals knew that there were burrowing owls there. Um, but, and so then we had to you know, participate in the sequel process and fight to uh, get recognition that there were, it was indeed occupied so we could get six and a half acres. So this was another failure of CDFWs um, to suggest that six and a half acres was uh, adequate habitat uh, for survival of uh, uh, an individual owl or a pair. The 1995 uh, staff report, oh, this is the, the same thing to offset the loss of foraging habitat on the project site, a minimum of six and a half acres. Uh, also, it says the, the protected lands should be adjacent to occupied burrowing owl habitat. Well, that doesn't happen either. So even if you did get the developer to pay into a mitigation bank, um, it, it's not, it, it doesn't mean that uh, it's next to, it's adjacent to occupied burrowing owl habitat. So that didn't happen. So CDFW's failures um, were initially that they didn't develop a conservation plan as the US Fish and Wildlife Service did. And they issued guidelines or recommendations instead. So, so an example of this uh, guidelines is uh, at a project in um, Davis um, Mace Ranch Innovation Center, um, the hired biologist uh, went out there and said, uh, oh, nope, there's no burrowing owls out here. Well, they did their survey in November and December, and it was botanists who went out there. Um, and so we said, so we wrote letters participating in CEQA, issued a comment letter saying, you didn't follow uh, CDFW staff report, uh, there's a protocol, there's a survey protocol in there and you didn't follow that, you're supposed to also do a survey during breeding season. Oh no, the developer says, uh, and, and the lead agency, the city goes along with them. Oh no, those are just recommendations, we don't have to, we don't have to follow uh, those guidelines. So uh, the failures uh, of the staff report in 95 and uh, 2012 to allow passive relocation uh, without alternate boroughs and uh, the 1995 staff report um, recommending that six and a half acres was adequate habitat to support burrowing owls. So um, our next conservation failure is the environmental California Environmental Quality Act. So the idea here <clears throat> was a noble one, but it doesn't work. <clears throat> well, only if citizens participate. So the idea was that the lead agency would assess a project for significant environmental impacts. And the lead agency could have that done through the preparation of these different instruments. It could be an initial study, a negative declaration, a mitigated negative declaration, or an environmental impact report. So, so the lead agency, oh, let's see, there was something else I wanted to say here. Oh, and so the other, <clears throat> So to, to try to get some of the wildlife agencies involved in these projects and assessing the environmental impacts, uh, one of the requirements was that the lead agency uh, should, uh, whoever has the land use jurisdiction who's issuing the permit, so it's a, a city government, local governments, uh, board, county board of supervisors, Caltrans, um, who, whoever is um, issuing the permit, uh, the, the lead agency uh, should submit this a uh, project proposal to the state clearinghouse, to the state clearinghouse where um, the state clearinghouse where the wildlife agencies then could go there and see the project and have an opportunity uh, to make comments on it to say, oh, hey, no, wait a minute, you know, there's this rare endangered plant uh, on this project site, according to the CMDDB. 
So, so that was another, it's supposed to be another layer of protection. So the lead agency um, has, is supposed to um, assess uh, the environmental impacts and to mitigate those impacts to less than significant. So, but those impacts, uh, the, the lead agency can assess those just by a checklist. So it can say air quality. Oh yes, air quality will be impacted, but less than significant. Or they can say, oh yes, uh, swings and hawks will be impacted, but oh, less than significant. So just a little checklist rather than a full environmental impact report where you actually have professionals um, go out there and do research and actually see um, what's there. Um, and so then, so this lead agency then is supposed to uh, determine what are these impacts, and then they're supposed to um, uh, determine if they, they can reduce the impacts the, uh, with mitigations to less than significant. And even uh, when that's done, the lead agency can say, okay, yes, there are significant impacts, but that's okay, we're going to have overriding consideration because it's more important for us, our community to have this project than it is to mitigate for these uh, the loss of these natural resources. So the lead agencies uh, can be city council, county board of supervisors, water district Caltrans, and who are these people? Um, they're people, you know, who got elected to this public office. So they could be, have, they may be a business person, a retired school teacher, an actor, a golfer, and most often people who have no experience with CEQA and no, no idea of what their authority is uh, under CEQA. Um, so uh, the lead agency determines the appropriate level of review. So they get a project, the project component says, we want a permit for this, and they say, okay, we'll give this here, we just need this little initial study uh, and we'll say, okay, oh, well, there, maybe there is this significant impact, but we're going to, we're going to mitigate, we're going to mitigate it. So it, it'll be less than significant. So they can decide if they accept an initial study, mitigated negative declaration or an environmental impact report. So we had a situation in Lancaster where the city of Lancaster determined this Royal Investors Housing Project, the appropriate level of review was a mitigated negative declaration. The city didn't send the project proposal to the clearinghouse because the city decided, the staff at the city, they didn't know. So they said, uh, there's no significant impact, so we're not going to send it to the clearinghouse. So Fish and Game didn't even have an opportunity to uh, do its job as a trustee agency. So the biologist uh, here, the hired biologist, went to this project site and says, uh, just one, one site visit and says, uh, there's no burrowing owls on this project site. There's the male there and the females down here. It's always of interest to me that the developers, biologists don't find burrowing owls, but the local amateur photographers do. So some of the uh, community activists, they contacted the attorney general and they did investigation to discover that Lancaster had approved multiple projects with minimal environmental review and outside the purview of the trustees. They did not send uh, the projects to the um, clearinghouse. Um, so the attorney general deputy uh, notified the city, uh, hey, you know, you guys, you're really supposed to be sending these projects through the clearinghouse. So, you know, nothing really, uh, no consequence to the city and all of the critters um, uh, that didn't get any mitigation, uh, the habitat that was lost through all of these projects was uh, just gone, poof, in the air. So we had another situation um, in uh, Winters with a project called um, Winters, Winters Highlands. It was 103 acres, and same thing, a hired biologist goes out there and says, nope, no burrowing owls out there. Of course, all the locals knew they were there because they were using the property for passive recreation, and they saw the owls there all the time. So the, um, so the city of Winters uh, said they were going to have a mitigated negative declaration, and some of the mitigation that the, the lead agencies would accept would be stuff like, um, well, we're going to teach the um, construction workers uh, to look for a small brown bird on the ground. And if they see a small brown bird on the ground, then they have to call the foreman to uh, come and stop, stop the construction work, stop, stop the job. So that's not likely to happen, right? So anyway, we participated through CEQA, we wrote letters, and we uh, got them to do a focused uh, environmental impact, uh, a, a focused uh, review just for uh, biologic. And um, so uh, Jim Estep went out there and he found three pair. And so that was back uh, in the first 1995 a staff report. So uh, 
So for 103 acres of habitat, uh, we got 19 and a half acres uh, that the developer had to purchase at uh, ELC, um, um, can't think of the name of it, at Mitigation Bank <laughs> in Solano County. So not, not in Yellow County, so not adjacent habitat and also not occupied, not um, breeding. After I did a public records request, uh, you'll see Gridley Mitigation Bank, uh, it turned out that there never were uh, any breeding uh, burrowing owls at that mitigation bank, another uh, CDFW failure. In uh, Davis, uh, there was a project uh, where this is private property, you know, I, I respect that private property, they wanted to build a Marriott hotel. That was the project proposal. Uh, we knew about one pair, one pair of owls on the site. So the lead agency, the city of Davis, decided that mitigated negative declaration uh, was the appropriate level of review. <clears throat> and that mitigative negative declaration is that even though the project may have a significant effect on the environment, there would not be a significant effect because revisions to the project have been made. And the initial study indicates there will be no impact or it is less than significant uh, because of mitigation. So the mitigations that the city um, accepted um, from the project proponent so, so the city uh, certified a mitigative negative declaration as the appropriate level of review on a project with a special status species on the site. They accepted eviction as mitigation, where we've already seen uh, uh, CDFW says uh, eviction is a significant impact, not mitigation. And they accepted a pre-construction survey as mitigation. Pre-construction survey is avoidance. That's somebody walking in front of the tractor to make sure there's not a burrowing owl there. So the city left us, we, what we wanted from the city was we wanted them to stop doing that. Stop accepting eviction as mitigation. Stop accepting a construction survey as mitigation. Uh, stop uh, uh, saying that a mitigated negative declaration is the appropriate level of review for our project site with a special status species. That's what we wanted the city to stop doing that. We were trying to teach them some. So anyway, the city wouldn't deal with us. And whenever this, whenever lead agency gets into these situations, it's the project proponent, you know, that bears the burden of the costs uh, of, of everything that is related to the project. So, so we were left to deal in our um, settlement, we were left to deal with the, with the developer and we got way more uh, for the owls from the developer than we could get from the city of Davis. Um, so we got a qualified burrowing owl biologist who went out there and found actually there were three pair uh, on the site. And then also um, she was able to monitor it um, through the uh, construction phase. We got phased grading so that there were burrows available. Remember I said uh, CDFW wants all the burrows excluded. So we were able to get phased grading. So there were burrows available to them on one side of the property at when the other side of the property was graded. We got 15 owls banded. The developer paid for the owls to be banded. And from that, uh, we had one adult female who, uh, P15, um, she came back to the site. She, she was evicted from the burrow. She came back uh, to the site uh, the first year. Um, she actually, I saw one, one juvenile, so it was uh, su successful reproduction that first year. She came back two more years. Um, and uh, so, so it was interesting to see, we talk about site fidelity you know, with burrowing owls, that they'll always come back to the place they were successful before. And then that was a serious case of site fidelity. And we also got some artificial burrows installed um, and we got them to uh, not plant some trees and to lower some of the landscaping. So we weren't the only ones uh, who noticed that this, uh, this uh, Environmental Quality Act was not uh, working. Uh, some employees um, at CDFW issued this, um, or it was back it was fishing game back then, uh, in 2008, the guidance for burrowing owl conservation. So they wrote, legal protections under CEQA does not substantially contribute to burrowing owl conservation because lead agencies have broad discretion in identifying impacts, whether they're significant or not, whether they're uh, mitigated to less than significant, and even where they do find significant impacts, they only need to be mitigated to the extent feasible. As a result, lead agencies do not require sufficient habitat mitigation for impacts to burrowing owls. Current conservation activities 
are implemented piecemeal at the level of an individual owl, and that's something like a pre-construction survey to avoid take. So what can you do about that? This is a big one. Participating in CEQA takes a lot of time. And uh, you have to be uh, you have to be on the list with your local government, and they'll send you a letter when they have uh, when they start a CEQA review process. And there's a certain number of days they tell you this is the period of uh, the comment period, or this is a scoping session. And so you have that amount of time uh, to submit a letter. So if you're familiar um, with the property or the habitat at a proposed project site, uh, you might look at that document and say, "Oh no, no." If you can't do a mitigated negative declaration here, there's this rare plant out there, or there's this uh, critter out there, you have to, you know, you can suggest you have to do a full environmental impact report. And then you want to make sure that you get your letter, that you get your comment letters in, uh, because that gives you standing. If we had not written a comment letter, we would not have standing to be able to sue the city of Davis. So where does that leave us? Um, we need to get, we need to get this bird listed. Um, the California, uh, the California uh, Burrowing Owl Consortium uh, debated uh, internally for uh, many years about the pros and cons of trying to get the burrowing owl listed uh, on the endangered species list. Um, and uh, finally, uh, they realized after all these years that the conservation efforts in place were not working, the owl's population continued to decline. And so finally, uh, Center for Biological Diversity, um, Santa Clara Valley Audubon, Albion Environmental, and some others uh, compiled a petition to list, and I don't know if you've ever seen one, but it is mighty yeoman work to compile a petition to list, and so they did that. Um, but the um, Fish and Game Commission denied that petition. You have to show uh, that this species has declined within a significant portion of its range. And while lots of people thought that the petition did that, um, the commission denied the petition. So after that, uh, CDFW promised they were going to issue a conservation strategy, which never materialized, and instead we got the flawed 1995 and 2012 staff report, which I've already talked about. So uh, my push now is um, we need to get a new status assessment. We need um, to contact um, uh, organizations, usually they're Audubon organizations since they're into birds. So uh, right now, um, San Joaquin Audubon is uh, putting together um, a new survey uh, so that they can compare um, uh, from the other survey from the Institute for Bird Populations. It doesn't have to be that way, but you don't have to do that method, but uh, it helps you know, to show consistency um, and it did to show a trend. Um, so uh, we, need to, we need to get the status assessment. We need to get these uh, surveys uh, so that we can submit another petition um, to list. Um, one other thing that you can do um, that you need to put this phone number in your phone is if you see a violation in progress, uh, at the time, somebody harassing, uh, sometimes, sometimes it's photographers, rabid photographers are harassing uh, burrow, uh, burrowing owls in their burrow. Um, you can call, um, the wardens will come, it's Caltips, and this number is just for violations in progress. And uh, we've had great success with um, uh, the wardens uh, coming out um, afterwards, nothing else happens. But uh, when the warden comes out, uh, at least you can get the thing uh, stopped in the moment. And so does anybody want to ask me anything or shall I, are you planning on going for an hour or 15 minutes? Shall I tell you a fun story about um, migration and abandoned owl or do you want to ask questions? Sorry. Uh, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, I'm not seeing questions in the chat. Uh, let me go to gallery view. And uh, see if anybody has their hand up. Um, why don't you go ahead and tell us a fun story while we? <laughs> okay. Well, all right. So whenever you're, whenever you're out uh, birding, please, please look and see if um, you can see a band. Um, we, um, Jack Barclay and um, uh, Lindsay Harmon um, did a review of uh, all of the banded California banded burrowing owls that were turned into the bird banding laboratory. And um, they found that only 2% uh, were ever recited. So if you see a band, uh, you're gonna make a bander really happy if you can uh, report that. Um, so they get, um, what, what, this is uh, Jack Barclay, we hired uh, to band some owls for us at Wild Horse Golf Course. And so they get a little examination, they get weighed, they get checked uh, for mites. And then um, uh, you can tell the Canadians have a, a captive breeding um, project and they uh, have uh, green over black. 
Um, so these eight craft bands, you can often see with your binoculars, but the, the federal band, you can't usually read unless you have a, the bird in your hand. Um, so this was fun um, uh, painting um, the show with the, and that's, and that's the Canadian band, green over, green over black. Um, and the, just to show, put, you know, please look uh, for the bands and it's checking, uh, the banders checking for it. It's a migratory bird. Um, and you wouldn't think a bird uh, that small could go that far, you know, like 90 miles a night. Uh, some of them uh, came from uh, British Columbia, you know, down to um, uh, Oregon and Washington. Um, and so uh, there are, uh, are in my area, there are uh, resident owls. But like I said, whenever you say, say anything about a burrowing owl, there's always an exception. Um, so where do uh, California burrowing owls go? They go to Domino's in Lompoc. So this owl was banded in July uh, at Wild Horse Golf Course. And in October, it was found in Lompoc. So that's a first year bird found behind this rock in the back of Domino's. So, so the manager, the Domino's manager called uh, Fish and Game and Fish and Game called the rehabber and so they got the bird uh, into rehab and it wasn't sick. It was just tired and, and hungry. And so after a little while, um, they were able to release uh, the owl at Vandenberg Air Force Base. The end. My word, that is such a great story. So could you tell us again, um, what times of the year we're likely to see burrowing owls, you know, in our neighborhood? Because out here we see them a lot in the fall and spring, and then they, like, there's none out there now. Yeah, there, you, you probably have migrant owls, and they, um, I had the one that I showed you uh, in the, um, in the pile of wood, the plywood, yeah. uh, that one came in October, and a pretty, pretty close timing. One year I noticed it on October 14th and another year I noticed it on October 12th. So I figured it was a migrant bird, you know, coming back uh, to its place. Um, so breeding season is from February um, to September 1. So, and they're pretty, they're pretty obvious, like after the second week of, of May, because the owlets are out and the parents are both feeding them. So they're really obvious during that time. Hmm. So here it's July. It seems like our burrowing owls should still be around, but I'm not seeing them at the burrowing owl resource area in Berkeley, or rather it's in Albany. Uh, did they leave or are they just not managing it because it's completely overgrown now with wild radishes? Oh, yeah, they won't like that. Hmm. So should we, uh, should I get on the park district and tell them to cut back the radishes. I mean, they, they trimmed the field earlier this year, but now it's just wild and crazy again. Yeah, I, that's, I always had trouble with that with the city of Davis to keep the vegetation down. That, that's, that's always an issue, even though I had volunteers a lot of times and we would go out there and do it ourselves. We would cut mm -hmm. it ourselves. Um, but you would see like in the beginning, at, at early February, you would see they start uh, bond, pair bonding and courtship, you know, in February. And then, you know, they pick, they move around a little bit until about, you know, March or April. And then they, they settle down. And once they have their eggs uh, or young there, then they're not going to go any place, even though the vegetation um, gets tall around them. Um, but yeah, if you didn't, if you didn't see them at the beginning of the breeding season, uh, then you had, you had migrant owls. They went back, they went back to their natal area. Okay. Hmm. Well, let's see. Does anybody have any questions? Um, let's see. Let me see if I can unmute everybody. Can I do this? Uh, I guess people, you can just unmute yourselves and speak up if you have questions. Um, this is Kathy. Uh, are the ground squirrels a, a threat to the bur burrowing owls? I always see 
tons of ground squirrels where the burrowing owls are and do they ever go into their holes and eat the eggs or destroy the nests yeah the it'll it'll be it'll be reciprocal so the owls will take the young of the squirrels and the squirrels will take the young of the owls so they do do that <laughs> Um, I had this one researcher tell me that he went into this, um, went into this uh, den, it was bifurcated and, and it went on the one side, it was a, a squirrel den and on the other side, it was an owl den. So they were, they were living on the edge there. Um, but they mostly, the owls mostly take abandoned um, burrows and I've seen them um, when the owls have a burrow and I, I've seen the squirrels, it seems like the squirrels think it's like entertainment, you know, to come and like harass the owl. And the owl gives them an attitude, you know, they put their wings out and they hiss at them. And... So uh, what's, what's uh, I, listening to this, as, as you warned us, it's distressing to hear how dysfunctional our government is um, as, as just individual concerned citizens. Uh, what's the best thing we can do um, uh, to, to help with burrowing owls. It sounds like we want to get on board with getting them listed. And then how do we keep track of all the development that's going on and figure out if there might be owls there and, and whether they need to be protected? What's, what can individual people do? Um, if, any, if any of your uh, members are also Audubon members, um, I would urge the Audubon chapters um, to do a, another survey of their area. So when the Institute for Bird Populations did the statewide census, a lot of the contacts and volunteers were recruited through the Audubons. So my understanding of the way Audubon works is that the individual chapters can apply to California Audubon to get a grant to do these surveys, uh, although most of the work is uh, done by volunteer citizen scientists. Um, so I, that would be what I would work on, and that's what I am working on, is trying to get these assessments to get them listed. Um, otherwise, I'm looking for... Um, uh, projects, uh, um, organizations that have uh, burrowing owl projects going. So um, Pomona Valley Audubon, they have a burrowing owl project going. Um, uh, Foothill, uh, Sierra Foothill Audubon has a burrowing owl project uh, going where they've installed some artificial burrows. I think it's on, um, I think it's on cattle uh, grazing land, which, um, you know, that keeps uh, the livestock, keeps the vegetation short. Um, and then uh, there's also, um, San Jose, uh, Santa Clara um, County has a, um, an HCP, NCCP, uh, and they, uh, the uh, uh, Santa Clara Valley Audubon, they sued the city of San Jose. And so they got this big, I think it's a hundred some acres of burrowing owl habitat that they're managing. And uh, uh, they've actually had uh, good populations and good reproduction there. And um, they, uh, my understanding is that they have applied uh, for captive breeding. Um, so that's a, uh, that's a very promising um, project. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Oof. Oh. Um, are there, uh, does anybody else have questions? Just unmute and speak up if you do. The um, other thing I would do uh, with the Audubons is um, to ask your Audubon a chapter, you know, to how come we don't have a burrowing owl project? Let's develop a burrowing owl uh, project. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. That's a very good idea. Um, um, it's Kathy again, when you say a project, uh, what are some examples of projects? Because at the Albany bulb here, there is quite a section uh, set aside for the burrowing owls. And I've actually seen a couple there. So maybe we could encourage more burrowing owls there. They seem yeah. fairly protected. Um, yeah, yeah, you can. You'd, you'd want to find out, you know, who, own, who runs the project, who owns the project and partner with them. How can you support them? Um, maybe it would be some volunteer work. Maybe it would be installing artificial burrows. Maybe it would be monitoring. Maybe it would be being a docent like they had over at Cesar Chavez Park, you know, to make sure that people aren't harassing the, harassing the owl. It would be, I would try to find out who is managing the project, who, who owns the land and, and uh, get their habitat management plan and uh, monitor and uh, be involved in uh, what they're doing to promote the population. Okay, well, it's the regional park system. So, um, mm -hmm. so they're very approachable. Okay, uh -huh. 
Great. Well, and, and the you. other thing, the other thing that you want to do is uh, you want to be uh, where the decisions are being made. So, for example, if you're the lead agency, you know, you want to run for city council. You want to be one of the members uh. of the agency who's voting for what is the appropriate level of review. If you want to be on a board. You want to be on one of the boards that are making decisions like the uh, California Coastal Commission. They're not going to be making decisions on burrowing owls. But as an example of where decisions are being made or, or your county parks, you probably have a uh, your county uh, probably has a parks uh, advisory committee you know, to be on that and see so, so that you're at the place where the decisions are being, where the decisions are being made. Okay. There's a question. Because the, in business, the business interests are very good uh, at positioning their people and the points at where these decisions are being made. Yeah. There's Thank a question you. in the chat from Lois Yuen says, so frustrating about lack of enforcement. Have you found that some offices or areas have negligent staff versus actually conservation oriented staff at both California and US level of fish and game and fish and wildlife. The, the individual people I think really care and they're probably horrendously frustrated working within the government system. I, I think the, I, I think this, of course, <laughs> there's a lot of politics. Uh, you know, if you're the, uh, you know, if you're the uh, head of uh, CDFW, uh, you and your your budget comes from the legislators. Uh, you get a lot of push if uh, you want to start talking about uh, on private land. Uh, we need to protect burrowing owls on private property. Um, so there's a lot of politics within the agencies, uh, you know, that that direct the policies of the agencies, which is another reason for you to run for elected office. Oh my. <sighs> Uh, any other questions or comments before you all oh, go? So I'm not sure I answered that. The individuals oh. I find, the individuals in those agencies I find to be very passionate about it. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife more often does the right thing than, than the state, than CDFW. Excellent. All right. Um, before everybody goes, I just want to remind you, um, that on August the 13th, that's next month, Amos White, who is the founder of 100,000 Trees for Humanity, will uh, be presenting to us about planting trees, which he and his group and other volunteers are doing all over the East Bay. I plan to join him. He says they're gonna start planting trees in, again in October. Um, but he will tell us about planting trees and the benefits of trees and all the other good things his uh, organization does. So. I am like totally looking forward to that. Uh, let's see. And oh, oh, since you since you said that, <laughs> yes. grasslands. There's a study that grasslands actually um, uh, sink more carbon than trees do. Okay, I well, share that with you. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll have to find a uh, hundred thousand acres of grass for humanity. <laughs> All righty. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, especially. Thanks Catherine. for inviting me. Catherine, this has been just a great presentation. Really appreciate it. Good night. Good night. <laughs>